Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Barnesville Baptist Church. We're very pleased to have everyone here in the pews and also online. A few announcements to get us started. Uh, first, as uh, we begin this uh, new chapter in our service to the Lord, as we uh, seek uh, uh, a new pastor, uh, let us pray for the Lord's leading and wisdom and will uh, for each one of us and as a church family as we seek our next pastor. Uh, just a brief update on the pastor search committee. Uh, that was formed at the uh, business meeting this, this past week. Uh, the members are uh, Lee Michael, Ellen Williams, David Bennett, Donna Belcher, Larry Michael, Luke Fetters, and Jan Burdett. Our first meeting will be on Tuesday the 13th uh, by Zoom. It will be a time of prayer and Bible study as we uh, center ourselves and prepare for this task. So please pray for us. Uh, a few more announcements. Uh, today, we welcome Dr. John Gauger uh, to the pulpit. Uh, he'll be with us today and also two Sundays from now. Uh, next Sunday, Reverend Michael Thompson, who has been here before, will be preaching. The Love Our Seniors Luncheon will be held Tuesday, February 13th in the Fellowship Hall at noon. So I know uh, Nita and Donna uh, have that. All good there? All right. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, Bible study and prayer will be held this Wednesday the 14th at 7 o'clock, uh, so uh, please come out for that. Uh, any other announcements? All right, let's begin. Good morning, church family. Good morning. I love worshiping God together with each of you today. Let's begin our worship with praising our Lord Jesus Christ for loving us, <coughs> saving us, and lifting us up. Praise God. Today, let's give our hearts, our faith, our service to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me as we sing our call to worship number 107, <laughs> Love Lifted Me. Oh, 
us in Jeremiah 31 3b I have loved you with an everlasting love therefore I've continued my faithfulness to you what an affirming assurance we have in God that he loves us forever everlasting and unconditionally first John 4 first John 4 10 tells us in this is love not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What a redeeming, amazing grace. Amen? Join me as we sing number 111, The Love of God. John 4 19 says we love because he first loved us revelation 1 5 b to him Jesus Christ who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood Jesus Christ is our Savior loving us freeing us from our sin our provider guiding us 
and through his loving heart is with us through all of our experiences. Join me as we proclaim our love for Jesus by standing and singing number 560, Oh How I Love Jesus. pray with me. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, for your kindness, for your mercy on us. Uh, before we knew you, before we, we, we loved you, we were your enemy, and yet you still loved us. And so we thank you for that today. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for the good and precious gifts that you bestow on each one of us. And so now in this time, we lift up our prayers of worship and praise and thankfulness to you. We ask a blessing on each person, each family represented here. We pray for those on our prayer list who are sick and traveling, our seniors, those, those who need your, your, your touch of healing. We ask a blessing on them. And now we lift up a prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you join me now with the responsive reading found up on the wall and in your bulletin? It comes from Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, 
As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Welcome everyone here. Welcome everyone watching online. Uh, we're glad to have you here this morning to, to worship with us. Um, just a couple things to echo some of the stuff that's in the announcements. Continue to pray for us as a church. Pray for the pastor search committee as, as we start to uh, go forward with that. We'll, we'll provide regular updates. We may probably have a spot in the lantern for, for updates and, and things like that to keep you informed of of where we're at. Um, we'll probably have some participation pieces for you, um, a survey and stuff to give us ideas of what we will make sure that as we, we, we have a survey, we'll develop a survey, we'll, we'll take the survey, you, know, you guys will provide survey details, we'll tally those things. Um, this is all the things that Ron Blankenship talked with the deacons last week. Then we'll build a profile of the pastor that we're looking for um, and we'll also do a profile of the church and the community, and then we'll start to uh, start to look around for uh, resumes and things that, that, that match up with that. So that's just a little bit of where we're talking. Um, but we are also glad to have Dr. John Gogger with us today. He'll be here this week and then in two weeks from today. So, uh, um, and like Lisa said, Michael Thompson will be here next week. So. Um, so it's time for our offering. So, Ed, would you come and, and lead us in the offering? Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, awesome God, what a glorious day you've given us. We thank you for the many blessings on our home and our family. We thank you for Barnesville Baptist Church and those that have attended, and those that are watching online. We thank you for every good and perfect gift that you've given us. Now, Father, we give back to you a portion of everything you've given us in our tithes and offers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Jan. That was lovely. Please rise for our Doc Sowell. church Good anybody have any questions as I have answers <laughs> yeah uh, all right because you don't have any questions I have a question why should we pray and we're doing this a little bit because obviously the little guys are not here but we have some online Jesus said to pray in his name and it should be in his will well, I've tried praying in his name. I want a Lamborghini. But I guess the answer is no, because I've been praying that for quite a long time and have not seen one. I did get a little model in once. Uh, but we pray to access God's attention. Jesus said that you pray, God, God will listen. So what do we pray? We pray in his name. We don't pray for Lamborghinis necessarily, but we pray for each other. Pray for health. Uh, right now, we're obviously we're praying for the church for a for a new shepherd for our church. Uh, sometimes it's nice to understand that we have a direct line to the Creator of the universe. Scripture tells us when we pray, God listens to us. So. Whenever you have any kind of any kind of an issue, lift it up in prayer. We lift each other up in prayer, just in general. Or if there's sickness or or different problems that we have with uh, with each other, with ourselves, with whatever, we always can lift each other up in prayer. Up in prayer. So I want I'll keep keep that in mind because especially now in, in the church as we go through this transition period. Keep it in prayer. Keep the evil one away from us as best we can. So let's pray. Father, I do thank you that the little ones listen, that they can unhear and understand your word uh, through people that, that aren't ashamed to preach your word as it is. I ask you to bless this day, bless this church. In Christ's name, amen.
all I have, and now I'm laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God, and you'll have every victory. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Um, today we have in our, our pulpit uh, Pastor John Gogger. A um, couple things I learned from him. He is a retired pastor from Perryville Baptist Church. There's, not, there's plenty of Perrys over in that area, Perry Hall, Perry, a few other things, but uh, Perryville Baptist Church. And he's also worked uh, with the uh, Maryland Delaware Association um, and still from time to time works with them. But uh, we're glad to have you here, and we'll look forward to your message today, and, and even in two weeks. So, come, come, bring bring God's word to us today. Thank you. Well, let me first apologize for my mask. Sometimes people are bothered if they if you don't wear a mask. I know some people are don't mind it at all. Uh, uh, but then I go to places and they say, come on, tell us the truth. Are you uh, wearing a mask because you're sick? And uh, I can tell you with honesty uh, that I am not sick because I wear the mask. Uh, and uh, I do that for my, my mother-in-law. She's almost 92 and we care for her now. And she still remembers who we are, not much else. Um, and she is a cancer survivor, seven major cancer surgeries, including two brain surgeries, and the mother of all surgeries, the Whipple, where they open you up and they take out all of, or part of five or six organs. She got six, might as well get your money's worth while they're in there, and we just don't think she's going to make it. I do take my mask off all the time when I'm preaching and teaching and eating, and one of those times I actually did catch COVID. I, I stayed away from it for three years, and I, I caught it in the fall, and it laid me down tired as all get out, but it wasn't all that bad. However, uh, my family feels comfortable that my mother-in-law has never struggled with that, so I've never given it to her, and Lord willing, as much as I like you all, I, I'm going to try not to catch anything from here. I go to a different church every Sunday. So I'm um, sampling the germs were all over Maryland and Delaware. And uh, God's so kind that uh, I've never taken anything to her. The one time I did have something, I was so sick that, um, but just tired that um, my wife's already away. Go to the room. <laughs> and uh, I didn't come out of that room for a week and a half, probably. So that's my excuse. And just wanted you to know it's not that I'm sick uh, and it's I've got somebody we love, and that's, uh, at least it's better than before. I um, told one of my family members uh, when COVID first came out, you know, I said, I'm on the um, pandemic crew at the, at the hospital, my local hospital. I'm trained to do different things, you know, active shooter or whatever. 
And if they declare a pandemic, which by the way, they never did. If they declare a pandemic, it means the hospital is so full that there's people on the floor and the halls and everywhere. And then we do 12 hour shifts trying to help everybody you know, hang in there. And I explained, I was, I, I could happen, we have a pandemic. And they said, that's just wonderful. Where are you gonna live? You know, uh, are you gonna live at the church or are you gonna live at the Motel 8? You know, uh, not six, it's two better than that. And, um, uh, and I realized, ooh, we're taking this really seriously here. <laughs> and thankfully they never call it a pandemic and I never, uh, at the hospital, and I never had to, to uh, live out of uh, my old office at church before I retired, which is good because I would only have a sink uh, to wash up in. Now, um, uh, what a balanced day we have today here. Uh, first, we heard about um, prayer. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, we asked the question, you know, why we pray, something like that. And I, I asked the question, why do we read the Bible? You got it all covered just in one day. Isn't that great? Uh, the, um, uh, you know, the Bible is a central part of this worship service. I walked in and they were kind enough to let me uh, stay for the second portion of the Sunday school class. That's Bible. I look and you've got, uh, you know, Bible during the week and the, el- the deacons are going to get together and they've got some Bible and prayer, we've got Bible and prayer. And, uh, we, and uh, I think if you stay at this church just a little bit, you'll know that people are encouraged to read their Bible daily. Uh, why? Why all this emphasis on reading the Bible? And so I would invite you to turn to Isaiah 55, and I'll show you uh, one of the answers that the Bible provides. Now, if you open your Bible in the middle, you'll find the Psalms. And then if you go to the right, uh, you'll find Isaiah. I'm not preaching in Habakkuk. I preached at a church one time, and even the pastor there didn't have Habakkuk. The pastor said, uh, well, I knew you'd preach in the New Testament, and she wasn't even sure if that was in the Old. Uh, it was a she. And uh, she came uh, ill-prepared. <laughs> uh, when you preach in Habakkuk, generally speaking, nobody's going to say we just heard from that last week. Uh, I'm taking a chance. Nobody's heard from Isaiah 55 last week. And if you have, uh, maybe you haven't heard this way, so hopefully it'll be okay. Isaiah 55. You want to look in the scripture uh, because you want to find out uh, what's that guy saying. You know, up front, uh, you want to know, uh, is, it, is he just speaking nice things he's heard or is he speaking the Bible? And uh, uh, nice things I've heard, uh, who cares? I'm not sure if I want to hear the nice things I've heard. But uh, God's word, well, then we should care about that. We want to be interested in that. Check it out. Because if I say something and it's not in there, uh, you don't have to follow it. And in fact, maybe talk to the deacons and they can back out of two weeks from now and they won't have to endure it twice in a row. Also, what if I'm just not doing a very good job? That's okay. Uh, just read it on your own. And you'll gain something just reading the scriptures. I'd say take notes. The bulletin is so full. I'm not sure if there's any place to put it. But um, I always put, oh, on the back. There is a place. Excellent. Thank you, brother. So there is a place we can put notes. And I encourage you to take notes. If I say anything you want to remember, take notes. If I don't say anything worth it, take notes. It'll keep you awake. Uh, And I do that. On a lousy sermon, I take notes. I just throw it away right away. Uh, and if I hear something I want to remember, then I take notes on that. Uh, and just taking a note gets it in my mind. And sometimes I'm going to take it home. I'm going to put it away in my file right away. So we're Isaiah 55. I think you found it by not by now. Isaiah is uh, just such a great, great, uh, rich <coughs> book. And um, I don't know. I might preach again from Isaiah next time I'm here. I'm not sure. But uh, I, I love to, uh, to speak in Isaiah because, again, not too many people do. And I'm not uh, repeating what you've just heard. Isaiah 55, and uh, here's the answer to why we spend so much time on God's Word. At least I think it is. Uh, verses 8 and 9. And, and this is uh, God speaking. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is the English Standard Version, whatever version you're using. If it's a translation of the Bible, it uh, says about the same thing. Um, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
Well, I guess I'm able to do this because we did it. We used big words in Sunday school. Uh, you know, we talk about propitiation and expiation and atonement and redemption. Uh, and, you know, you don't maybe want to use that with an early elementary Sunday school class. I think by the time we're up in youth age, we could use that. Um, but big words, you know, help explain um, deep thoughts. Those were deep thoughts we had in Sunday school. I encourage you to be there. I just live 100 miles away, uh, and uh, just hard to get away when there's chores to do in the house in the morning uh, and get here. Uh, anyway, that's my excuse. If it was really important, I know I could make it here. Uh, I just don't like getting up for five on a Sunday as a regular routine. I don't do that. Now, uh, the big word I want to share, two big words, is synonymous parallelism. Because uh, you students of the Old Testament, know that's exactly what we're looking at in verses 8 and 9. Uh, more simply, we can say this is uh, Hebrew poetry. Uh, and this is a device in Hebrew poetry. Now, you just could say, well, he's a pastor. He's been trained. You know, he's big words like that. I don't have to worry about it. Oh, please do. Please do. Let me explain what it is. You recognize, my wife teaches the Lady Sunday School class. That's why she's not here. And she can pick it out, you know, with one eye closed. And she'll say, is this uh, poetry here or there? You can see it in the New Testament, but you can really see it in the Old Testament, all over the place. You ever seen a place where in the Bible it says something? And then the very next verse, it says about the same thing. That's Hebrew poetry. That's why it's there. That's not American. We don't do that. Unless we're politicians, and then we only got one thing to say, maybe, and we're trying to bang it home. Uh, Hebrew parallelism is where you say something, and then the very next verse you either say the same thing or an opposite thing. This is synonymous parallelism. That is, it's the same thing. So forget the big words. It's just saying the same thing in one verse and then another verse. And surely you've seen that many, many times in the Old Testament. Some people even complain. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, they're both about the creation. it got to be two different writers. Or, I would say, maybe they're Hebrews. Because they love saying something and then saying something else. So look in verse 8. We've got uh, my thoughts and your thoughts. We've got God up there. He's got his thoughts and then we've got our thoughts. Uh, and then um, it says also, you've got my ways and your ways. Well, actually, it's your ways and my ways. So we got my thoughts, your thoughts, your ways, my ways. He flips it around there to, you know, me, you, you, me, to keep us interested in the whole thing. And then verse 9, it says, I'm just dropping down from the first few words, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. Why would you do that, saying two things in a row? Well, number one, because they're Hebrew. Number two, you always look to see what changed. So we don't think about that because we're Americans. Our poetry is roses are red, violets are blue, I like something, so do you. So you and blue, they kind of sound very similar, and that tickles our ears, and we say, oh, that's poetry. New poetry, you've got to explain that in a different way, but that's old poetry, okay? Uh, you and blue, and we like that. Hebrew poetry, what tickles their ears, is not the same sound, which is helpful because we can't read the sounds. We don't read Hebrew, or not too many of us do. Uh, they like to hear similar thoughts. So they have one thought. And then they say the same thing or the exact opposite thing a second time. So that's why they do that. And then the second time, look and see, did anything change? And lo and behold, in verse 9, it did. Because verse 9, it says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth. Just think about that. You know, we got a ground floor, we got a balcony, we got a steeple, we got a helicopter and flew overhead. Man, we could just see the higher you get, the more you see. If you're in, uh, you know, uh, a jet liner way up there transporting us, and on a day like this, you wouldn't be able to see anything. You'd just be up there and, you know, socked in in clouds. But if it was a, not a cloudy day, if it was a clear day, you could see just all over. You just, the perspective is so much bigger. The higher you get, well, how about if you get to wherever God is? You know, if you get to the third heaven, uh, you know, first heaven is the atmosphere, second heaven is, you know, all the plants, Third heaven, at least that's what they classically call it. That's where God is, the third heaven. If you get to the third heaven, I mean, you've got a perspective to see everything. Except our eyes, we can't see that far. God has not that problem. And so he's talking about his thoughts and his ways and compared with our thoughts and our ways. And then he says, 
as high as the heaven above the earth. See, you know, just think high. You get as high as you think you can in your mind. And how much higher that is than down here. And God's thinking is that much higher than ours. God's ways are that much higher than ours. And you, as parents and grandparents and maybe a few great-grandparents, have explained it to the younger ones all the time. You know, because they're like, I want this and I don't want that, you know. You know, I want to go to school. I want to get, I don't really want to go to school. I want to get my certificate without it doing, I want to get a diploma without doing anything. And sadly, college kids do that. Uh, and uh, they want to get a degree without doing anything, you know, or studying anything really hard. In fact, there's a lot of people who just want to live today. I've noticed people in their teens and 20s and 30s and older, you know, uh, some gal who was 40 ish uh, recently talking to, and like, I realize I'm an adult and I've never done anything. Well, you know, the bar is actually lower than 40. That happened a lot, of, you know, decades ago. And she'd look at her life and realize, I haven't done anything. I'm not doing anything. I don't have any plans to do anything. And there's a certain dissatisfaction with that. I mean, that's our ways, our thinking, compared with God's ways, God's thinking. And why do we look at the scriptures? Because we don't want to stay down here mired in our own way, our own thinking. We want to be stretched and elevated. At least some of us do. Some people are like, oh, please end the message. Not in Barnesville, thankfully, but there'd be some people, some place that I was preaching who would say, end this message because it just hurts me to think about that God's ways, I mean, it's going to make me feel badly that God's so much better than we are. Well, I guess you don't really want a God in your life because that would be the very definition of God, that he's better than us and he's smarter than us. He's got better ways and better thinking. And not only is that logical, but it's biblical. We just read it here in verses 8 and 9. So I've got three points I'm saying today, and the first is the what. The what. And the what of this passage is that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God's ways are higher than our ways. Because that's what the thing is saying. That's what the text is saying. God's thoughts and ways are higher than ours. Number two, point number two, is an application. you got the what, what's it saying? All right, what is the application of this? And the application I would suggest to you is that you and I are supposed to seek God while he's near. So we can know his thoughts and his ways. Now, am I just saying that because it's a good preaching point? Or is that what the, that verses 8 and 9 intend for us to do? Well, if you read the context, if you really want to read the context, read a few chapters ahead, maybe go another one behind. But yes, that is exactly what God wants. Look in chapter 55, verse 6. What does it say? The first three words, in mine at least, it says, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. And why are we going to seek the Lord? Because his ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts. So there's, there's an invitation. In fact, it's not just an invitation in the context. It's commanded to seek the Lord God, to know his thoughts and his ways. Now, how do you seek the Lord? Well, that is a, 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 could be a very deep question, but there's a rather simple answer provided right in the context. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. And, and see, I'm just talking about verse 8 and 9 in one sense, and yet verse 8 and 9 are not in isolation. You've got to look at the context. And so we, we're commanded in verse 6 to seek the Lord, and then how do you do it? Verse 7 is the answer. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Oh, thoughts, way, way, thoughts. I just remember them from verses 8 and 9. And so we're commanded, find God, seek him. And you're going to find you've got a problem with sin and give it up. Give up the sinful thoughts, give up the sinful ways. And so uh, here's how I explain what is happening then in repentance. When you repent, another uh, old-fashioned word, not used too much, not that long of a word, but big, big thinking there, because repentance is metanoia in the Greek, and it means uh, to turn. You turn from one way to another way. So if I'm walking in this direction in life, and I'm headed here, and I'm not headed toward God. God's over there. I'm headed this way, and all of a sudden I realize this isn't the right way. It's not going to lead to good results. 
uh, in my mind, at least I want to be with God, and I found that I'm not headed toward God at all. Repentance says that I'm going to have a change in my thinking, and it's going to lead to a change in my actions or my directions. If you see somebody that says, oh, yes, I was headed in the wrong direction, but now I have Jesus in my life, and he hadn't turned around, I never turned this on, did I? This one's picking me up. Great. Should I just keep, turn it back off again because you're happy? All right. <laughs> so excited to get the pulpit, I forgot to push the button. Thank you. And you're up there high. You might have been waving your hands, but I'm not looking. I'm sorry. And that's what a lot of people go in the wrong direction in life, and they're not looking. But they say, man, I heard something about Jesus. Yeah, I got Jesus. And you're still going this way? I don't think so. Now, you're not perfect because you've trusted in Christ. But if you haven't seen a change in your life, I'm not sure you have. I've preached that in my own church, and I've had people that come up. I had one lady, and she had to persuade me. Um, she'd been a Christian in another church and baptized for decades and been in our church maybe 10 years. And she said, I'm not saved. And I'm like, what? <laughs> 30 years? And she said, you told me about change in my life. I, I, I don't, I've never had a new heart. I said, Really? And I knew she struggled with all kinds of sin. Uh, and had a, a gal out of uh, Catholicism, and she said, oh, no, you know, I don't need any of this stuff. You know, I got Jesus already. I know that, all that. And, oh, okay, all right. But her husband had her come in and uh, listen to the preaching. And one day I talked about when you're saved, you get a new heart. Uh, and uh, she came to me afterwards, and she said, I've never had a new heart. That gal trusted in Jesus and anybody that was in my church the day I baptized her could tell you, you could see the glow in her face from the back of the church. And it was even a little bit farther back than the back of your church because she had been changed, and no doubt in my life. And the way she lived her life completely changed. What a bad woman! But everything changed because now she was Christ-centered. It changed her family and her work and all kinds of God started answering prayers. She was asking for new Lamborghinis, uh, but... Uh, all the stuff that they really, you know, were asking for is in God's will. It started getting answered. Because if you go in one direction and you repent, you're going to turn, you're going to go another direction. And there it is in verse 7. Repent's a New Testament term, usually. But here is an Old Testament illustration because I'm going in one direction. It says, forsake, leave. And then doesn't it say in that same verse to turn? And you're turning toward God? That's Repentance. You're giving up, whatever, and if you find I'm going this way, but I still got sin, you're willing to live like a person that's going that way? That's a reason why you need to say, God, please help me. i got to get rid of that sin. I've got to forsake it. It says it right here. Maybe there's somebody today that's listening, watching from whom, or listening right now, that you've got something in your life, and you say, man, I'm a believer, but I just realize I've grown, and I realize there's some sin I need to forsake. There's some turning I need to do. I need to seek the Lord while I may be found, because otherwise you'll be like... Uh, uh, a guitar player that stopped playing a guitar. I don't know if any of you have ever played, some of you played guitar and ukulele and banjo. and You know, that hurts your fingers when you start out. Or if you're a carpenter or whatever, and then you play it, you play it, and it hurts and it hurts, but it hurts less and it hurts less. And after a while, you get strong calluses. I used to have strong calluses. I haven't played in years. I got no calluses. So it would hurt if I grab, grab a guitar string. But if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, expose yourself to that pain, you get used to it. And it's fine. Same thing with sin. You keep exposing it to, it's yourself to it often enough, and you get used to it. That's why so many people trust in Christ when they're young, because when they're old, they're really used to it. They've got calluses, so the Bible would call a hardened heart. As believers, we don't want to harden our heart, get used to, well, I go to church. It's all right if I have a little sin here or big sin there. You know, it'll all balance out because I'm going to work my way into heaven. Well, we just heard somewhere today that that wasn't, maybe he was in Sunday school. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't do it. You've got to forsake the sin and turn to God because God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than ours. And that all comes from verses eight and nine. And, you know, if you think about our ways, where are our ways lead us? Boy, in our country, we are so efficient and productive. Our ways have learned, gone into, uh, developed all kinds of efficiencies and, you know, we've led the world, or we in a couple of European countries led the world in, in industrialization. We, maybe a couple of European, a couple of these, 
uh, uh, Oriental uh, countries have led the world in uh, digitalization. And, and so we can get things done so fast and so efficiently, you know, with the help of tools and all kinds of assistance that there is. So we can get a lot done. And we have relative wealth. We do. Uh, travel with me to some of the places I've been in the world. You know, a poor person in the United States is richer than most of the people in considerable part of the world. That's true. That's just true. We are. A homeless person in the United States has more resources available than somebody that has a job in the poor countries in the world, the poor countries in the world. So our ways have made us very productive, and yet we are relationally about shot. People don't know how to talk to each other. Children don't listen to parents. Parents know how to raise their children. Great grandparents, nobody listens to them. Uh, uh, a young man wants to meet a young woman. They don't know how to like walk up and talk to somebody. They have to get online and find some app that's going to talk, you know gather and you fill out a survey and you talk about what do I do? You know, I, I, it's hopeless. They don't know how to solve problems. What, you know, homes are just, it's a mess. People are so confused today. Uh, people aren't even sure. I was born a man, but I think I really am a woman. Women are like, I was born one gender, but I think there's another. And, oh, my lands, it's so confused. I can't even remember how many genders they've got now. 30-some genders. I, I, I can't even wrap my hand around that many. Two is a lot. But now we've got all these others you can choose from, and you can kind of go in and out of them all that you want. So it's like, God's creation is meaningless. Well, that's what our ways have done. Uh, and God's ways, oh, bring about order and beauty and forgiveness and strong relationships and committed marriages and healthy, functional families. Imperfect, you know, just like churches, a functional church, you know, that has problems, but they solve problems, they teach families. This is how you solve problems in a church, for instance. You know, we were talking about a church that has problems, and that church's never going to help any family with their problems because they haven't figured out, you know, how to do it as a church. Goodness, goodness gracious. You know, we do that as parents with children. Um, I was a bad example when I grew up because I did stuff I had to apologize to my children. And ask for forgiveness. But I was a good example because I apologized. And I asked forgiveness. I never threw anybody against the wall or anything. I raised my voice, had a wrong attitude. And my kids learned so much from that. They know how to ask forgiveness. And they know how to forgive. And uh, they actually did forgive me. They don't remember I ever did anything, you know, that needed forgiving because they actually forgave me. And, oh, what a great story that is to tell. So in any event, in this, these two verses today, we learn that God's thoughts and God's ways are higher than ours, as the heaven is higher than the earth. And number two, the application of that is that we're supposed to seek God, forsake what's not of God, give that up, walk away from it, and turn to God so that we can know, his, know him, know his thinking, know his ways. And then point number three is the why. I had the what, the application. Here's the why. When our thoughts are changed, we are changed. Does the Bible teach that? I think it does. We're going to have to go out to the much, much wider context now. But I'm going to give you three places in the Bible. You're probably familiar with these. Just want to, uh, in fact, some of you probably have them memorized. Uh, and so um, one of them would be um, this, uh, Romans 12.2. Romans 12.2. Anybody have Romans 12.2 memorized that they care to recite it right now? All right. Well, it says, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may, uh, see, I was starting memor uh, quoting it to you, and now I'm looking down to see what it says in mine. Uh, and mine's going to be a little bit different. Do not be conformed uh, to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, <laughs> And do you see how a person is changed? Um, we, we want people to be transformed, not by being like the world says, but being transformed. And how are we transformed? What's the big word in there that tells you? Look in verse 2. 
What's a word in there that tells us how we're being transformed? Renewing? What are we renewing? Mind! I, I was in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, wasn't it? Remember the thoughts of your mind and your ways, and here it comes again. We've got to renew our mind, and then what's going to happen when we renew our mind? We're transformed, and we have different ways. Oh, you can find that all over the place. A counselor that doesn't know that, you should not go to them for counseling. You know, parents need to know that, you know. We can't live with our kids all our life and say, do this, don't do that, don't do that, do this, don't, 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 don't. It's like the girls' basketball team that I saw yesterday, seven-year-olds, my granddaughter, my youngest one, and they had no clue what's going on. And they said, go here, go there, go there. And the kids dutifully follow, but they have no idea what they're doing. They just go there, and what do I do next? They don't have the concept of the flow of the game because you have to change their thinking so they actually understand what's going on. And then they can have different actions. And it's the same with anything in life. If you change your thinking about something, I'm going in the wrong way now. I don't think I'm going in the wrong way. Now I'm going to have different action. But if you don't have a change internally inside, you're not going to have a sustained change on the outside. That's just the way it is. And so Romans 12, 2 says change your thoughts and you're going to have your ways transformed. I want everybody to say transform. I'll say transform. You say transform. Transform, transform. Let's do it one more time. Now we've got the crazy thing I'm asking you to do. Transform. All right, let's just do it one more time. Transform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I think you're confident of that right now. If you don't remember anything else, remember today we talked about be transformed. From people doing their own ways and their own thinking to God's ways and God's thinking. All right, let's look at another verse, James 1. Probably fewer people. I think some people had that memorized before. Fewer might have James 1 memorized. James 1. But I think it's worth memorizing. In fact, it's a good chapter. When I was a teenager, I, mem I memorized the whole chapter. And uh, I've changed Bible translations from them several times. Uh, and that's why some people just get upset with different translations, because you memorize a bunch of verses, and then they, it changes. It says the same thing, but it changes. So here's um, James 1, verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. All right. So how are we going to be saved? How can we go from the anger of man in verse 20 to the righteousness of God in verse 20? We have to put away. Well, again, there's the forsaking. Get rid of the wrong ways, you know, and then we're going to receive the implanted word, the word, the Bible, the word of God. So here we've got what the word of God is doing. The word of God, if you receive that, you trust in Christ. If you don't believe what the Bible says, you're not going to trust in Christ. It's not going to be a genuine saving faith, is it? And so if you want to have your life changed, Romans 12, you use the word of God to change your thoughts. If you want to be saved, you use James 1, the word of God, um, to understand God's thoughts and God's ways so you know how to be saved. And in Romans 10, maybe somebody has this saved uh, up in their mind. I'm not sure anybody wants to say that this morning. Romans 10, 17. Does anybody want to show they've memorized Romans 10, 17? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or what does it say in mind? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Christ God. And so you say, well, you know, I'm saved, but I just, I want to be stronger. I want to have more faith. Want more faith? More Bible. You want to get a little more faith? Read a little more Bible. You want a lot more faith? Read a lot more Bible. You want to do it slowly? Read slowly. You want to do it fast? Read fast. Read a lot more. Not one minute of Bible and five minutes of uh, five hours of television. How about the, you know, a minute of television and that'd be hard on Super Bowl Sunday? I think. I think. Uh, but um, uh, you have control over that. If you want to grow, saturate yourself in God's word. And so uh, verses 8 and 9 in Isaiah 55 say God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. An application is that we should seek God. And then the why of this, if we're going to look broader in Scripture, is, is that if you want to be saved, if you want to be transformed from the inside out, if you want to go stronger in your faith, we turn to the word of God. That's why. 
We need to seek. But the what is that God is so much higher in his thinking and his ways. Now, I'm back in Isaiah 55. I don't know if you kept your finger there or not. But I want to just run past you another verse, verse 11. If I preach this whole chapter, I could have three or four messages. Uh, but I'm just going to give you, I just give you the highlights of some of them. And I wanted to lastly leave you with verse 11, uh, which says, so shall my word be. Well, you want to see what's a so shall. Read verse 10. I don't have time to do that with you. But verse 11, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. This is still God speaking. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Um, that makes me feel so much better about life. I've told God's word to many, many people that say, that's nice, or that's nice for you, or thank you, or something other than I want that. You know, and that's all right, because my job is not to take people by the collar and make them something they don't want to be. My job is to share God's word and see if they might listen to the spirit of God. They can say no to me. Can they say no to God when he's at work? And the promise here is if you and I use the word of God, it's going to accomplish a purpose. Now, we don't always know what that purpose is. Sometimes it might just give reason for judgment. Other times it gives reason for repentance. And we'll never know until we do it. In fact, sometimes we do it and we don't know for a week or a month or a year or a decade. Sometimes even a lifetime. You might go to be to heaven before that person finally acts on what you told them that one time. Isn't that something? So why are we looking at the word of God? Because it tells us God's thinking and God's ways are so much higher so we can seek him, so that we can be changed and grow spiritually strong. So now I come back to a church, Barnesville, wonderful people. I enjoyed you the last time I was here, and I'm reminded, you know, of your sweetness by just seeing you again. You welcome me so well, and I thank you for that. Most of you probably have good habits with the scriptures. But I'm just going to ask you, where are you, you in your discipline absorbing God's word? Because as a hard study and pastor, I have to tell you, there was a time in my life, oh, I don't know, a decade or two ago, where I was studying hard to teach this and preach that. And I realized that studying the Bible and making turning out lessons and messages all over the place. And in other countries. But I wasn't reading it for myself. I was satisfied just telling everybody else how God wanted to change them. But I wasn't letting God change me. That can happen to a pastor. It could happen to a deacon, Sunday school, any person here. There might be one person, might be two or three, within the hearing of this message that might say, you know, actually, I never got to a good discipline. Or I had one, and I kind of stopped. I kind of stopped. One man told me... Uh, uh, you know, just this morning, it's, it's God's will to meet you because just this morning, I asked myself in the mirror while I'm shaving, you know, I've studied the Bible for 20 years. I think I've probably learned enough. And thought, I'm not sure if I really need to do it. Then came talk to me, and we talked about Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, and he said, wow, it is still for me. <laughs> uh, you might have just heard that. You might say, I need to commit myself afresh. Well, you can tell the whole church or at least tell a friend. Whisper to somebody, friend, family, say, um, i got to get back in a good habit. Would you ask me in one week what I've done this week? Or, or something like that. Make yourself accountable. I love accountability. Because accountability, if I say I'm going to do something, I don't know. If I say you can ask me if I've done it, now I need to do it because I don't want to be embarrassed and say the wrong thing to you. Oh, no, no I didn't do any of that studying. That's why accountability, at least in my life, is so helpful. So where are you in your own discipline? Are you able to teach why the world is crazy and what God says about it? Are you, re, are, are, uh, are you able to give reasons why the Bible is accurate and helpful? You, you, do you have anything you can say about to, why we really should be centered in love? Uh, why we should take the time to make Barnesville Baptist Church stay strong? Um, can you say it from God's word? Because that's where the promise is. And of course... Uh, do you want to memorize God's word so it's in your mind, in your heart? Maybe that's the next step you've never done. Or maybe just say, uh, maybe somebody up there uh, at home is saying, ah, I, you got me at the place where I never had like a new heart. 
Oh man, call the church, connect with one of the deacons, talk to somebody right here that's with you and say, I, I want to hear about that again because I might not have done something. I don't feel like I ever had a new heart. Am I just like being religious or have I really trusted in Christ, genuinely been saved? Talk to somebody about that this morning before you go, I'm here, but you've got deacons and all that are going to be here for a long, long time. I'd like to pray for you, I'd like to pray for us, that, um, that God would help us to be renewed in our seriousness of Scripture or be grateful that God has kept us serious for so very, very long. Let me pray for you right now. God in heaven, I thank you for Barnesville Baptist Church. I thank you for their kindness uh, to others. I thank you for their commitment to Jesus. I thank you for their faithfulness to your word. Thank you for the beautiful way they sing about you and the gifted people that have led us this morning, the music and the other functions that we've had. Lord, I pray, Father, thanking you for every person here that is regularly faithful to start their day with your word and looking for what you would have them to learn that day. Help us to continue with that. Lord, I pray for every person here who has never gotten to that place or maybe has gotten to that place and kind of drifted away from it. I pray, Lord, you would help them right now in the quietness of their heart to confess their sin to you and to pray uh, for better discipline in that area. Help us to pray for each other, even now, Lord, to pray for somebody around us that needs to be learning from your word. Or maybe it's us. Hear our quiet, silent prayer in our mind. And our Lord God, if there's one who realizes today for the first time or the umpteenth time that they do not know you personally, they've never been tra transformed or changed, would you change them? Or would you help them to talk to somebody that can tell them how? We pray this to your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I invite you to respond. I don't know if anybody's going to respond by coming up front. You're certainly willing to do that. You're able to do that. You're invited to do that. You can respond to God right now when we sing this closing hymn. And you can talk to somebody during or after. I think I'm going to be, unless somebody moves me, I'm going to be up here afterwards. Somebody has something they want to tell me. Um, just praise God for the opportunity to have his word. And I pray that you all would stay faithful in attending to his word and being transformed by it. Uh, let's all stand now for our closing hymn. I'm going to face you just reminding you that you can respond if you wish to by coming to the front and saying something publicly or privately to me or to one of the leaders, one of the deacons that's right here. Presented this morning, let us each uh, draw close to you to repent of our sins, to ask for forgiveness, to allow you to transform us into to the man or woman, boy or girl that you would have us to be. Let us be salt and light to our friends and our family this week, and bless each one of us until we gather again.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Carl. I think you've got a word that we only have one verse on this. I'm ready to sing away. Oh, my God.